So Adam, a first one is how to get involved in clinical trials. This individual uh, believes they have generations and family with Alzheimer's. Talk a little bit about how that works from your perspective. Sure. Um, well, there are a number of different options for getting involved in clinical trials. Uh, the FDA has a website that everyone can search called clinicaltrials.gov. Um, probably many people are familiar with that. Um, I think that that's the most comprehensive source of information, so you could search for Alzheimer's disease and clinical trials. Unfortunately, it's not always the easiest to use, and so um, the Alzheimer's Association has uh, also a um, effort called Trial Match, which can help to um, find local uh, clinical trials, but I think, it, from my perspective, probably the best way to, to really find out what's going on is to either call our center or email our center and um, you can look on our website. We have all kinds of information about who to contact and clinical trials. Or um, Stanford, I think, also has clinical trials going on. Um, of course, we think UCSF is better, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's probably so. It, and I think around here, for, uh, that would be a quick way to do it. And I think the final way would be to talk about um, with your physician or the patient's physician, you know, what clinical trials are they've heard about, what they think is promising, whether they think it's advisable to look into something like that. So, Adam, you, it was a great presentation, and you talked about the uh, history with the amyloid hypothesis and, and some of that work. There's two or three questions that I've come across so far sort of getting at. Is your sense that the targets were wrong, that is to say that, that yeah, we understand why amyloid was of interest, but, but that wasn't the right target, or particularly talking now about the immunotherapy approach to this, or that um, there's, there's still questions out there about the fundamental approach of immunotherapy as a way to attack either the tau target or the amyloid target. Um, well, so I, I can give you my opinion, and everyone may not agree with me, but um, I think there, there is very clear evidence from the biology of Alzheimer's disease, from genetics and, and brain pathology studies, that amyloid is a really important factor in probably causing Alzheimer's disease. But, um, and I think most people would accept that. There's still a little bit of a question how important it is, but it's probably very important. But that being said, it, it may not be the best target for a therapy. So I would say that you know we have pretty good evidence that the immunotherapies that were used extensively in the past for Alzheimer's disease uh, were able, that targeted amyloid were able to reduce amyloid levels. Um, and other uh, pills that could prevent the buildup of amyloid also were able to reduce amyloid uh, levels. But even in that setting, it really didn't have much of a benefit for the patients. And, we should have been able to detect more of a benefit if there was really something there. And so it may be that, you know, um, unless we can remove amyloid from the brain at least 10 years, maybe 20 years before people start to have symptoms, it may be too late because the amyloid sitting there for 10 or 15 years may be starting processes like the buildup of tau that are irreversible. And so it's not that I don't believe amyloid is, is important for Alzheimer's disease, but um, it may be impractical as, as a target. And I think that the technology that was developed to, to reduce amyloid or remove amyloid, that it isn't over, we're still using it, but um, and it, probably some of those technologies worked, others didn't, but some of them worked, and I think even immunotherapy still looks very promising, but um, it's just the way we were using it, the timing and probably the populations who were testing it weren't appropriate. And that was something we needed to learn from doing clinical trials. And, and another question, I know you're familiar with this issue. So we see that a lot of people who are normal, that is to say they, they die uh, never having exhibited <clears throat> the, the memory loss, the confusion uh, of the dementia that we accom think accompanies Alzheimer's, uh, and yet at autopsy show significant accumulation of plaque. Uh, what's your thinking about why uh, does that, uh, what does that tell us, if anything, about the relevance of amyloid to the Alzheimer's story? So, yeah, so that's a good point that I, I didn't have time to really touch on, but um, we think, again, we look under the microscope at people's brains who've died from Alzheimer's disease, and we see these amyloid plaques and these neurofibrillary tangles, and they're all over the brain, and they're really extensively present, 
But if you also look at normal older people in their 70s, 80s, 90s who've passed away, who had you know, no memory impairments at all, or maybe just the slightest hint, and look at their brains under the microscope in the same way, you'll find that probably 20%, maybe a little bit more, of those people also have plaques and tangles. And maybe it's not quite to the same extent, but they're there. And so the question is, what does this mean? And, and I think the, the prevailing hypothesis is that there are certain people who are just resistant, that their brains, that whatever it is about them is resistant to this amyloid and tau pathology and that they're able to compensate. And, and some of the people who are resistant are people who tend to be very intelligent, who tended to have big brains to start out with, um, who uh, lived a healthy lifestyle. And, it's, it's really, I think, a, an important thing that we don't fully understand because maybe if we could just make everyone into someone who was resistant to Alzheimer's pathology, we wouldn't need to remove the amyloid and tau. But I think, you know, I think most of us believe that's something that's pretty hard to do and that probably there are factors that we don't understand and are too difficult to control and maybe operating from the time you're in utero that protect you from, from these Alzheimer's disease pathology. And so, Probably the, the easier approach, at least from what we understand now, is to actually prevent the buildup or, or reduce the buildup of, of, of tangles and plaques. Fascinating. Uh, several questions. Uh, you alluded a little bit, uh, maybe some of it came from Christine Yaffe's slide, uh, but, but about lifestyle. <clears throat> so there's several questions about uh, what's the relevance of exercise, why do we think it works, uh, uh, cognitive stimulation, for people, I, I know if, if you're a, a public television fan, uh, they've made a, a one of their sponsors over the years has promoted um, the benefits of cognitive stimulation. It's certainly out there. What what's what's the data tell us? So um, a lot of the data that um, I think Christine Yaffe and others have have sort of looked at to show that um, there are certain sort of lifestyle changes that can. Um, reduce the odds of getting Alzheimer's disease comes from epidemiology, from looking at large populations and looking, you know, what sort of lifestyles were associated with a reduced risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so we have to just, just be mindful of that, that there are very few actual experiments or clinical trials where we've actually randomized one group to doing exercise and eating a healthy diet, another group not to that and, and seeing a benefit. So, so with that caveat, um, if, if you look at all the possible lifestyle changes that you could make that, and actually did that in everyone in this country, it would have a big impact. It might reduce the number of Alzheimer's cases by 20% or more. Um, and so we think that you know, since these lifestyle modifications are good for you anyway, why not do them? So um, one thing is, is anything, there's a huge amount, you know, every day we hear more evidence that Anything that's bad for your heart is also bad for your brain. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if you have high cholesterol, those things are affecting your arteries and your peripheral body and your heart, but they're also affecting your brain. And I showed you that slide that most people who die of Alzheimer's disease didn't really purely have Alzheimer's disease. They also had strokes and vascular disease in your brain. So that's one way if you could reduce your, the hardening of your arteries by you know, living more healthily, that would almost certainly have an impact for many people. Um, there's exercise is really interesting. There actually have been clinical trials of exercise in Alzheimer's disease, and it does benefit the patients, although it's mainly in terms of mood and behavior and general well-being and not in terms of preventing Alzheimer's disease. And nobody really knows why that is. I think we could speculate there's some interesting theories that exercise may help the brain to regenerate itself. There are certain nerve cells that can regrow a very small population. Um, and that exercise may help that. It may also help with other sorts of, um, of releasing other hormones and factors in the brain that help the brain to work better. So we think exercise is extremely helpful and important, and um, why not do it? I mean, it's good for you. And, um, so, so that's also good. In terms of the, the different um, cognitive training programs or the online programs that you hear about that you see on your public television station or wherever, um, I think there is quite a bit of evidence accumulating now that, that, that our brains are plastic and particularly that as you get older there are certain parts of the brain, particularly in the frontal lobes, that are involved in sort of um, paying attention and, and 
uh, multitasking and things like that that aren't functioning as optimally as they could and that if you retrain them using these computer programs that you can actually um, concentrate or function a little bit better. But there's really an important point here is that um, all of these studies have only showed that these techniques work in people who don't have Alzheimer's disease or who don't have any sort of memory impairment and there's no evidence that they help people once they start to develop MCI, mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. So if you're cognitively normal, if you're someone who's aging normally, there are changes that occur in your memory and your thinking abilities and these appear to be somehow modifiable by these, by these retraining programs. How important they are for your day-to-day -day life or how long these changes last, we don't really know. But um, so far, there's no evidence that any of these retraining programs prevent Alzheimer's disease or are of any benefit at all to patients with Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment. Ruth. Uh, a couple of questions about <clears throat> beyond the Alzheimer's Association and beyond the US. Are, what do we know about other countries' uh, response to Alzheimer's disease in terms of uh, public policy, in terms of funding? So I think that's a really good question. You know, Alzheimer's now is very definitely an international disease. We're seeing um, um, the development of all kinds of uh, <coughs> programs and services for people in Scotland and Ireland, in England and in Germany, in Malaysia. There's a new support group in Russia. Now, in terms of research and funding and, and a commitment to this disease, France has developed a plan for Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are a few other countries that are looking at whether or not they can develop some outcomes and research. Israel's doing research, Germany's doing research. There definitely is some international research, and some of those are collaborative um, across um, the world, if you will. In fact, the Alzheimer's Association has an annual conference where they pull researchers together from across the world and talk about what they're doing and where they're going with it. So this is very definitely an international effort. And we're seeing Alzheimer's disease at multiple levels. The capacity of different countries to deal with this varies tremendously. Adam, a couple of other, uh, well, actually many other questions. But I know recently we, the Alzheimer's Association, presented a new investigator award to uh, a, Young researcher at UCSF, Dr. Beitner, I believe. Bit, bit Bridget. Okay, sorry, but uh, she's working on inflammation, and this is a question about inflammation. So, what, what, do you want to comment on why inflammation would come up as an issue? Thank you. Uh, why why inflammation would come up as an issue in Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. So, um, inflammation is is very so inflammation is a really hot topic and people are very interested in Alzheimer's disease. So um, again, if you look at the brain, so when people die, you look at the brains under the microscope and you see these plaques and tangles, many of them are uh, surrounded by immune cells or, or white blood cells basically, or diversions of white blood cells that exist in the brain. And it looks like these, so one, one hypothesis is that these white blood cells are trying to eat up the plaques or trying to remove the plaques and maybe the tangles and, and that's the brain's you know, in, innate ability to try and resist Alzheimer's disease. Um, on the other hand, there's also a lot of evidence that these white blood cells or these immune cells are releasing chemicals or, that are causing damage, that are causing more damage or causing more amyloid or causing more tau tangles to develop. And so um, there have been, again, these epidemiologic studies showing that some people who have a lot of inflammation in their bodies just that you can detect using blood tests or <coughs> other types of sophisticated tools are at increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And there's also been studies going on for years suggesting that some people who took high doses of certain non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen um, were protected from Alzheimer's disease. And so um, it's really an open question and, and I think probably the answer is that there's some inflammation that is good for you that is probably protecting the brain from damage, but there's other inflammation that's bad and that's causing part of the problem. And so what people are trying to sort out is, well, 
how do we block the bad inflammation and promote the good inflammation? And um, we think, for instance, that some people that these immune approaches to clearing amyloid and tau may even be present normally in some people, and that may allow them to resist Alzheimer's disease. And so when we develop these immune therapies, we want to try and promote this good type of inflammation and not the bad. Several questions about um, things the worried well can do. And, and specifically, a uh, question about, uh, can I get a PET scan? Um, should I get a PET scan? Um, what will it cost? What will it tell me? Uh, and then likewise about getting and rolling in trials, if I'm a, if I'm a seemingly normal 65-year-old, are there trials that, where I might be useful? Um, so again, this is all changing. Um, so in terms of the amyloid PET scans, there's, um, we do not recommend that anyone who is normal get one now. And, and in fact, although the one of, two of the amyloid PET agents are approved by the FDA, they're not approved for people who have no symptoms. And they're only to be used in people with no symptoms in the setting of research. So the A4 study that I told you about really is designed to study not just the effects of removing amyloid and treating people who, have, who are normal but who have amyloid in the brain, but also the effects of disclosing the results of an amyloid scan to people who are normal. We don't know. I mean, it could be extremely devastating to hear that you have amyloid in your brain. And in fact, there have been studies that have been done that show that people who learned about having amyloid in their brain actually did worse on tests after they learned about the results. So their cognitive function declined just, just by hearing the result of an amyloid scan. And so we have to, we don't recommend that anyone do this, and it's not really probably of any benefit except for research at this time. Um, and so, you know, if anybody tells you, well, go out and get an amyloid scan, you could do it. You could pay $5,000 and get a scan, but don't do it. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, in terms of research, yes, there are you know, uh, normal aging programs that we uh, conduct and others that are funded by the NIH. Um, so at UCSF, we, we'd love to have you participate in a normal aging program where we follow you just to try and understand how you do over time. Um, and then there's this new study, the A4 study, and there'll be another related study probably in a couple years where um, we'll just take a very limited number of people. Probably in the Bay Area, it's probably going to be no more than 100 people. 50 people, I would guess, total will be enrolled in the study. Um, but those people will get um, a PET scan, and if you have amyloid in your brain, you have a chance to receive this drug, solanuzumab. So um, we're not yet recruiting for the study, and we just it just started. We just started preparations, but probably in two or three months, um, yes, you could contact us. And if you're interested, um, take a look at our website. You can contact us, and we'll put you on the list. And, and get back in touch with you when we can actually start um, enrolling people. So, Adam, will, would people go to uh, the Memory and Aging uh, Center website and, and be able to learn a little more about this when the time comes? Yeah, we, so we can't officially post information about this study yet until it's approved by our Human Subjects Review Board, but um, once it is, we'll put information. And if you look on the National Institute of Aging website, or the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, which is the NIH-funded research group that um, does clinical trials, um, you'll find information about this A4 study. It's called A4, uh, and so you can learn a little bit more about it. Also, if you read about the National Alzheimer's Project Act, it's part of that as well. Great. And Trial Match, Adam mentioned earlier, you can just Google Trial Match. Trial Match is uh, something the association created because we hear from researchers like Dr. Boxer and others that after money, and it's a, it's a distant second, but after money, the single biggest impediment to advancing research is participation in clinical studies. So really, uh, everybody in this room, it, it, you, you might be surprised there are a variety of studies around the country that are looking for normal controls. Sometimes the research is simply an online uh, data collection that you can participate in. Um, and you always have a chance to say no. So if, if they say, ah, yes, we want you and we want a spinal tap, you can say, well, that's not maybe what I signed up for. Although, although I have a couple of board members and a couple of staff members who participated in the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative and did have the spinal uh, uh, fluid exam, and they assured me that it was 
relatively painless and harmless and not that big a deal. And information on trial matches in your packets. Excellent. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks. So similar similar theme, Adam, about taking the Alzheimer's meds. Um, the cholinesterase inhibitors, Namenda. Uh, I'm a I'm a 65 year old. I, I I sometimes forget my keys, but I think I'm doing okay. But mom had Alzheimer's. Should I start taking? Should I get my doctor to give me these meds now? Um, so I think if you're concerned about your memory, you should talk to your doctor about it. Um, you know, if you are go through all of those different steps to diagnose Alzheimer's disease then it's likely that one of these medications may help a little bit, um, but we, there's good evidence that they don't help people who don't have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and even in mild cognitive impairment, they probably don't do a whole lot. And in fact, one of the medications, Namenda, um, has been used a lot in people with mild Alzheimer's disease, although it was not approved by the FDA for that use. And um, a lot of research has shown that basically it doesn't help those people. So, so the answer is no, you shouldn't take these medications unless you have Alzheimer's disease. Thanks. So I think I know the answer to this question, but it's such a great one, I have to ask it anyway. For Dr. Boxer, are you related to Barbara Boxer? <laughs> and, if, and if so, can you help Ruth? Exactly. <laughs> I wish I was related to her. I could help myself to get it. <laughs> shift public policy there a little bit maybe. Um, so questions about the impact, there's been a lot of talk about this. I know uh, Dr. Yaffe and others have, have been part of the research around um, concussion uh, and we, the, you know, the League of Denial, the whole, the whole NFL issue uh, certainly has been in the news recently. Uh, what's, what's the relationship that we understand between concussion and Alzheimer's disease, concussion, and other forms of dementia. Uh, talk a little bit about what we think we know so far. So, so again, this is a rapidly evolving field and there's a lot we don't understand yet. Um, but what we do know is that um, some of the famous football players who've died young from dementia and had a sort of unusual form of dementia that didn't look exactly like Alzheimer's disease. It looked, a little bit more in many cases like frontotemporal dementia and they were tended to be younger and they had a lot of behavioral problems and mood problems often depression other things and when they looked under the microscope the biggest studies were done in Boston they found that there was a huge there were very very severe amount of uh, deposition of this tau protein that's in neurofibrillary tangles um, but it's a little bit different than what we see in Alzheimer's disease um, and probably more severe than in Alzheimer's disease in many cases, and also in many cases without any amyloid. So um, we think that both chronic traumatic encephalopathy and Alzheimer's disease involve tau, but it may be that the, the whatever causes the tau to build up is different in the two diseases. Um, and uh, you know, until just six months ago when these new tau imaging um, agents Came, became available, we didn't think we would have, be, have a very easy time of figuring this out during life. We could only really diagnose chronic traumatic encephalopathy at autopsy, but now I think we'll really be able to sort this out better. There's also, over the years, been a lot of study of head injury as a risk for Alzheimer's disease, and one of the interesting um, things that had been noted about 10 or 15 years ago is that there's this genetic risk factor for late onset or the most typical form of Alzheimer's disease called apolipoprotein E epsilon 4. And when you have one of these um, genes, you're at a slightly increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And if you have two of these genes, two copies of this gene, then you're at a much higher increased risk. And it turns out that people who get a head injury, even a mild head injury sometimes, um, who have an APOE4 allele are also at increased risk of getting memory problems and other things. And so it may be that there are also common risk factors for chronic traumatic encephalopathy and Alzheimer's disease. But we're still not sure about it. It may be true, but I think we're going to learn a lot more in the next five or ten years about this, is whether really having a, a traumatic brain injury, whether it be mild or, or more severe or chronic, really leads to Alzheimer's disease or whether some of the people who were said to have Alzheimer's disease and also had head injuries really had chronic traumatic encephalopathy and 
there may be some overlap between these disorders. I think we're just not sure. But I think what we are, you know, very hopeful about and, and we think is that if we can develop therapies that target tau, they're going to likely be helpful for both of these disorders. And so it, in a sense, it won't really matter. But um, So that's sort of where we are right now, I think, with, with head injury. Can I just add to that one of Please. the things? that we're looking at right now is the Department of Defense is very interested in this right now with the troops coming home. And so we're in collaboration with them on a study that's looking specifically at head injury and also incidents of Alzheimer's disease and if they can draw from those and conclusions to those in that regard. So interesting, interesting topic. Great. Ruth, here's a question I know you get with regularity. Um, it's not a public policy question, but I know. But what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? <laughs> well, and, and Dr. Boxer can probably answer this um, much better. When, I, when we talk to families about dementia versus Alzheimer's disease, I think of dementia as the umbrella term. It's describing a set of symptoms and includes confusion, disorientation, forgetfulness, and an array of other problems. But what we want to know is what's causing the dementia. Alzheimer's may be uh, a large, irreversible cause, but there's many other things that might be reversible or might be some other form of dementia. It's very important to find out what it is that's causing the dementia. So when we talk to families, at least from my perspective, what I say is, is ask the doctor what's causing the dementia. Do they think it's stroke? Do, have they run the test to make sure it's not thyroid or blood sugar or any of the other things that could be causing some of those symptoms? And Adam, that's a, a, actually question that I, I had for you. So um, mild cognitive impairment. So it, it's a relatively new clinical category. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say I have a concern. And I wonder if you share it or if you see it or if you think, Matt, it's probably not going to be a problem, Bill, uh, that physicians are reluctant to tell people they have Alzheimer's disease. That's part of why over half of them never get diagnosed. You never get told or, that, or their families are never informed that the, the doctor thinks it might be Alzheimer's. That MCI is kind of a, it, it's a, it's a half measure. That is to say from, from the physician point of view, well I can tell them that it sounds better. Uh, so it's a little easier to tell people that oh, it's just a little mild cognitive impairment. And it, it keeps the, it sort of gets the physician off the hook. Are you concerned about that at all? Uh, yeah, I think I am concerned and I think it's, um you know, particularly in our healthcare environment where physicians aren't paid to take care of Alzheimer's patients and they don't often have the time to really discuss the implications of the disease, you know, it may be easier for a doctor to say, oh, well, this is, you know, mild cognitive impairment and um, not do that. And I hope that with Ruth's efforts and the Alzheimer's Association's efforts, we'll um, figure out a way to allow physicians to spend more time with our patients. Um, you know, the intention and the reason why people have been promoting this idea of mild cognitive impairment is not to, um, not to sort of use this instead of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but it's really the idea is to detect the disease much earlier so that we could intervene and um, either with you know, lifestyle changes or once we have a really um, effective therapy to use it before someone is so impaired that, that they're no longer able to live effectively, uh, independently. And so, um, you know, I think there is that concern that sometimes people are told they have mild cognitive impairment when they really have full-blown Alzheimer's disease. Um, but I, my sense is that it doesn't happen that often. I mean, I think it's something that I'm concerned about too, but you know, I still say it's the minority of, of cases in my experience. Um, but I think you know, we need your help from the Alzheimer's Association to really raise awareness and reduce the stigma of getting an Alzheimer's diagnosis and to increase the amount of support. Um, and I think in California, one of the issues that's a problem that Ruth sort of raised earlier is driving. And there's a law that um, if you have a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, you have to get reported to the DMV. And I think some physicians are reluctant to do that because it interferes with their relationship with their patient. And so if you have to say to the person that's mild cognitive impairment, legally you're not required to report to the DMV. And that allows, so physicians I think are left in this bind. They don't want to, you know, really interfere with their bond with the patient. And so they sometimes, you know, do that. And I think we're all, I mean, I, I felt guilty of, of that thinking in that way in the past. So I think it's difficult. Can I just add to that one other thing, I'll be real quick. 
one of the things that I think regulatory wise, regulatory wise, one of the implications is huge because there are requirements in California around dementia care. And if you're if you have somebody in a care facility that has dementia, then you have some regulatory requirements. It's much easier for the facility if they're MCI. And I have heard some people getting into a bind with that where they don't you know, they don't want mom to have Alzheimer's disease because then she has to be in a different part of the facility as opposed to not and working around those kind of stigma issues as we develop regulations that we not put people in a position where then they're compromised or they're not safe. Yeah, I mean, I would just add that there's, there's a big misconception, I think, still, and you often see this on the news and it bugs the heck out of me, that, you know, just because you have Alzheimer's disease doesn't mean you're gravely impaired. And I'd say that many of us go to cocktail parties probably and talk with people who would meet a diagnostic definition of Alzheimer's disease and they seem totally fine and you had a great time, you know, talking to them. And so many people, most people, probably are very mild and they are still able to function in many ways even though they have that diagnosis. And I think our society needs to change and appreciate that. And just because you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease doesn't mean your life is over or that you're not able to function socially or in other ways. That's a great point. I mean, one of the fundamental changes in my 26 years is the participation and the active engagement of people with a diagnosis. And I think at the heart of that is that we identify them so much earlier in the course of the disease that they are at our public policy forum, they speak at our walks, uh, they're probably here in the room today. Uh, they're just part of our world and our work in a way that they were not 20 years ago. Uh, so final question, uh, I just want to say to all of you, there were a lot, I know there were a lot of questions I didn't get to. Some of them were very specific about uh, your, your, your personal situations. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Boxer will have a few minutes to hang around afterwards. Uh, most of the questions were for him. Here's my final question to both of you. And it's a why question. I, I, I'd like to hear you, both of you worked in this field for a, for a long time. Um, and Ruth, you, you talked about this over $5 billion for cancer science, uh, similar dollars for heart disease research, HIV, etc. $500 million with an M for Alzheimer's disease research. Why? Why? What do you think the problem is for us as a society and a, and a body politic that, that gets us those results? You know, I think part of it is the recognition of this as a significant disease. Um, as I said earlier, I think there's a piece of us, and, and I go around the country a lot, there's a lot of people who still sort of say, oh, you know, mom had something, but she didn't have Alzheimer's disease. You know, those people, that's a whole different thing. People don't understand it very well. And Congress is no exception to that. You know, our goal is to get that up to $2 billion in the next two years. Whether we'll be able to do that in the, in the current climate, but if we don't, the ramifications are huge when you look at the numbers, just the pure numbers. But you're right. How do we do that? How do we change the framework of how people think about this disease? And that's that's our growing challenge. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, I agree with you, Ruth, and I think um, also our society is very focused on young people and in general, you know, we don't value older people as much, I think, and it's a problem, and we don't respect them, I think, as much as we should, and um, we don't value their advice, their experience, you know, what they have to offer, and so people are just, you know, I think our society is much too um, willing to write people off once they develop gray hair and look a little bit older and just say, well, whatever, you know, make, make room for the young people. But I think that's a huge mistake, and, and we do that to our own detriment. Ruth Gay and Dr. Adam Boxer, thank you very much.